Have people heard of the, the, the so-called antibiotic apocalypse? Yeah. Yeah. So the idea that antibiotics are increasingly becoming ineffective against certain diseases, so uh, bacteria is becoming more resistant and so on. And this is really serious, obviously, because antibiotics were one of the biggest breakthroughs in medical knowledge that we've ever had. Um, and that if antibiotics become truly um, ineffective, it's going to be extremely difficult to practice modern medicine at all. So all manner of um, diseases from, from, from TB to gonorrhea will be completely untreatable. Um, and what's more, um, all sorts of, of procedures in hospitals, from hip replacements uh, through to chemotherapy, through to cesarean sections, um, could well become too dangerous to perform. So effectively you're looking at taking medical practice and procedure back to the 1920s. So really, see, you can't think of a much more serious um, public health issue. Why has this happened? You know, yes, yeah, sure, we all take, we've all taken too many antibiotics, uh, but there's actually a far more structural reason. Uh, first of all, uh, the incredible numbers of antibiotics that are pumped into animals, into livestock, um, in this country to a degree, but far more in the United States and other places um, around the world, where in order to keep animals in very close and unhealthy conditions, you have to pump healthy animals full of, full of antibiotics as well as hormones and whatever else. So we need to stop that for a start. Um, but also, the pharmaceutical industry simply hasn't found it profitable enough to research antibiotics. So we haven't found any new antibiotics for the last 30 or 40 years, um, unnecessarily. Um, because nobody's put money into actually investing and researching this stuff. And the pharmaceutical industry, the big pharmaceutical corporations, take their profits uh, extremely seriously. That's how they've become the most profitable economic sector in the, in the economy, in the global economy. So just to give you some idea, um, a couple of years ago, the last year for which we have proper, proper figures, the top 10 pharmaceutical corporations Made, and made a profit of $90 billion. So it's an extremely profitable sector. If you put it in percentages, the net profit margin is nearly 20%. That's double fossil fuel. So that's on a level with banking and finance. Um, so it's an extremely profitable sector, and they haven't become that profitable by researching drugs that essentially aren't going to make them any money like antibiotics, that are fallback drugs, that by the time they really come online, their patents will have, will have gone. Um, and so they won't have any money uh, to make out of them. So this is a real crisis. And uh, uh, there's a guy called Jim O'Neill. He is a chief economist at Goldman Sachs. So he's very much part of the establishment. But nonetheless, he said, in the next 20 years, if pharmaceutical corporations continue to behave this way, they will be thought of in exactly the same way that we have thought of the banks after the financial crisis. They will become the really big villains of society. So you better sort it out if you don't want to be thought of in that way. Um, and, and quite right, because at the moment, there's about 700,000 people a year die because they become, whatever disease they have has become resistant to antibiotics. By 2050, you're going to be looking at 10 million people a year potentially dying of diseases that are now treatable because we don't have antibiotics. So, antibiotics are just one thing, just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there are huge numbers of diseases that are not treatable today because we haven't put enough resource into finding cures for those diseases. And we haven't put enough resource in because there is not enough money to be made out of those treating those diseases because it's primarily poor people in the, in the world who suffer from those diseases. So you're not going to make enough money out of delivering drugs for poor people, so you don't develop them. You develop drugs for, uh, I heard the other day at one of these meetings, actually I never heard of it before, double chin syndrome. Apparently there's something that can get rid of your double chin. They've been putting a lot of research money into it. Um, so all manner of diseases that affect the well-off in the world, huge amounts of resources put into, um, but, but really, really serious problems that are, that are killing um, and, and, and causing huge suffering around the world. Um, nowhere near enough resource. And, and this is even beginning to affect us. So uh, a couple of weeks ago we released a new report 
on this area. We worked with uh, Stop AIDS, the Stop AIDS campaign, and also a, a, a campaign called Just Treatment. And we were looking at drugs that have been developed with public money. So our taxes have gone into developing these drugs at an early stage. Yet when they're fully developed, the NHS has to pay astronomical costs to get hold of these drugs. And it makes a decision. I mean, either it says it's just too expensive, we can't afford them, so it's, it's just sad, but it's too bad for people who are suffering from these diseases. Or they do pay for them, um, but of course it costs an absolute fortune, which just increases the deficit and the strain that the NHS is under. So there's a couple of examples I want to give you. And, and, and again, really, it's the tip of the iceberg. Um, I struggle sometimes with, with, uh, with some of these names. They sound to me a little bit like uh, ancient Mesopotamian kings. Um, but there's one drug called abiraterone. Uh, it's a treatment for prostate cancer. Um, very effective. Uh, discovered thanks to public funding um, from the University of London um, and tested by the NHS. So public research in there from the very beginning. Um, through a number of acquisitions, you often find this with drugs. Often quite small, innovative companies um, bring these drugs to market, but then those companies are taken over by the big giants. That's what they spend a lot of their, their money on. So now it's, 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 this drug is, is owned by Janssen, which is part of Johnson & Johnson. It was marketed at a price so high that it was deemed too expensive um, for the NHS. Following about five years of negotiations, two reviews, huge amounts of pressure from people suffering from prostate cancer and from the Department of Health, finally the price was dropped to a level that was just about acceptable but still really expensive. During those five years, about 6,000 people could have benefited from the drug, could have had their lives saved by this drug but weren't able to get hold of it because it was too expensive. Even at the lower price that the NHS now spends, it costs about £98 per day per patient. Despite the fact that it only costs £4 to produce. So a phenomenal marker. There's a second one. This is called Alentuzumab. Uh, this one was discovered at Cambridge University with some public funds. It was brought, up by a, uh, brought out by a pharmaceutical company called Sanofi Aventis. Uh, it was originally licensed for leukaemia, um, but when they were researching it, they also found, and you find this with a lot of drugs, that they, 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 they can deal quite well with multiple different conditions. Um, and at a lower dose, it's very good for treating multiple sclerosis. Um, and this sounds like good news, you think, well, this is great. Um, except its corporate owner then says, well, we don't want it to be used for multiple sclerosis at the prices it's being charged at now, because it's, it's fairly low dosage. We're not going to make enough money from that. So they completely withdrew it from the market and got it re-licensed. And in doing so, they ramped up the prices. So first of all, if you were treating multiple sclerosis before the re-licensing, it costs about two and a half thousand pounds per course per patient. After two and a half thousand pounds, after they re-licensed it, they put it on the market for 56,000 pounds per patient per, per course. It's a 22-fold increase in the price of that drug. So public research money was ploughed in, in the first place, from the government, through the university system and the NHS. Um, and then they put it on the market for such an astronomical amount of money that the NHS um, can barely afford it. This is a really dysfunctional system. Um, and, and it's really the result of drug companies having such phenomenal power um, in, in, in the world. Um, not just the patents they're granted by the government here, but a whole set of international trade rules that these companies have lobbied for over the years to essentially mean that they have monopolies, large monopolies on, on vital drugs that people need in this country and, and around the world. And there's a whole uh, a section of international trade deals um, that, are, that are concerned with this. It's called TRIPS. Trade-related intellectual property. For some of you who have been trade campaigners for a long time, you might remember um, the, the TRIPS rules that were brought in internationally by the WTO. But those TRIPS rules are getting stronger and stronger. And big pharmaceutical companies are lobbying, so in TTIP, in TPP, in TSA, and all of these new trade agreements, for patents to be even stronger, cut down on any loopholes, um, lengthier uh, patents, um, so that they control the price of the drugs for a lot longer, and then they charge essentially whatever the market will, will bear. 
um, for those for those drugs. So we end up there with a, with a drug industry, a medicine industry, which for many of us should be one of the most important sectors in the world if we're interested in creating a more healthy world where people can access the drugs that are going to end their suffering and lengthen their lives. That rather than genuinely developing new useful products for us, is actually spending its time lobbying for new rules to increase its monopoly power so that it can charge more money for its products. Um, another thing that they do is called evergreening. What they do is essentially change a drug that already exists and they've got a monopoly on when it's coming to the end of its, its monopoly, the end of its 20 year monopoly. And they'll make little changes to it. They'll put it in a different form, a liquid rather than a tablet, or they'll add something to it, or whatever it is. And then they'll say, we want another 20 year monopoly on it, even though it's, it's really the same drug. Um, and there's a whole process now where countries like, um, and I know Simon Gillies going to talk about this, like South Africa um, and other countries are told, well, you, you have to, you know, you can't produce generic medication um, that effectively functions in the same way because they still have a, they still have a pain on this, on this medicine. Um, now, the pharmaceutical industry will tell you, well, research takes a long time, it's very expensive, and that's all true. But it's also true that it is nowhere near as expensive as they like to pretend it is um, and that justifies them charging the kind of prices that they're charging. So, for example, pharmaceutical companies today spend far, far more money on marketing their products than they do on research and development of new drugs. Um, and that's clearly where some of the price that you're paying is going to. Also, and this is a more recent phenomenon, they spend more money now buying back their own shares than they do researching and developing new drugs in order to keep their stock price high. So this is about short, I mean, it's the, it, it's the same rule that applies to so many aspects of the global economy. It's about short-term return for shareholders um, and to hell with the consequences um, for the people who need this medication. So, it's a frightening picture, um, but I want to end do the second half of, of, of my talk talking about some hope. Because it, does, it really doesn't have to be this way. And, and the voices that are saying this needs to change are growing louder and louder. So I talked about Jim O'Neill already. The, uh, and again, a pillar of the establishment. You know, not somebody who's going to sit in our uh, activist meetings um, and listen to the kind of changes we want. But he's calling for a radical change in the system. He's saying, look, rather than give these companies a patent of 20 years, why don't you just give them a cash prize if they invent something? And then it becomes patent free. And then essentially you can use that technology and know-how, you can transfer that into the technological commons. You can make it common knowledge. And just imagine the amazing research that could be done if all of this stuff was held as, a, as common property. Just imagine what we could have developed by now. The kind of things that we, could, that we could treat and cure. So this is somebody very high up in the establishment who's just saying, doesn't work. It's not fit for purpose. Uh, many of you all know Joseph Stiglitz, uh, again another famous uh, economist, written books uh, about some of the problems with globalisation. He says, and he wrote an article in the Guardian about it this week, again, uh, and I'll, I'll quote him actually, the economic institutions and laws protecting knowledge in today's advanced economies are absolutely antithetical to providing for basic human needs such as adequate health care. And what he's arguing, again, is that the whole system of giving um, uh, monopolies, of handing monopolies over to big corporations, um, is, is not only bad for ordinary people, but it's holding back our ability to innovate. You know, in, the, in the modern knowledge economy, this is a major obstacle to us being able to develop new products um, that could actually be useful. And again, he's calling for um, a kind of technological um, commons um, with, with free knowledge. Now, we're saying in our campaign, look, the very, very minimum you need to do is to, is to say, if you're getting public research money for this stuff, then you need to make sure that the final product is provided to people at an affordable price, both here and in the developing world. At the moment, the British government does not do that. So that's the first thing. The first thing is if we're giving taxpayers money for this stuff, um, then there must be strict conditions put on it. And that's just basic, I think. Really basic. But I think we're also beginning to develop now really striking new ways of thinking about how we can develop our knowledge, how we can improve um, our, our medical and technical knowledge. There's a photo, yeah, that's great. Um, 
and potentially completely break up this whole way of doing research and development, which frankly is something suited for a uh, hundred years ago and not for the kind of economy and society that we have today. Now, I'll just finish by saying that, that the whole reason Global Justice Now is working on this is because for a very long time, and you will all know this, um, we have seen the, the immense power of corporations, of transnational corporations, being a major problem, fueling poverty, inequality, climate change, fueling the desire to put short-term profits ahead of people's needs in the world. And so we believe that we need to do something about this. The pharmaceutical industry is one of those industries um, where I think it's just so obvious um, that it's, it's working in a way um, which is, is not helpful um, for the future development of, of, of people on this planet to give people healthier and more productive lives. Um, that, that's why we think this campaign is a really good campaign for exposing that. We think it's possible to make changes in the whole model of pharmaceutical corporations and we're going to start working for that. But actually we also need a much bigger change. And for those of you who were here um, a little while ago, Dottie was talking about um, a treaty, a UN treaty that would control the behaviour of corporations by making sure that they were accountable in international law for human rights violations. And preventing people getting affordable access to medications is precisely one of those examples of what we would regard as a human rights violation, a violation of someone's economic and social rights. And patients who are in that position would be able, under a UN treaty, to take an international case against these corporations and to say to the government in which this corporation was headquartered, and of course some of them are headquartered here in Britain, um, you have failed in your duty to hold these corporations to account for their human rights violations, and we demand that you put measures in place to regulate these corporations. So we see this as one little example of how you can begin building support for a treaty that fundamentally changes the way that corporations behave in the world. And it's absolutely urgent because we did some research about a year ago and we looked at the top 100 economic entities in the world. And we found that of those top economic entities, if you look at it in terms of revenue, um, 69 of the top 100 are corporations, not countries. If you look at the top 200 economic entities, about over 150 are corporations, not countries. So corporations, the top corporations in the world, are more wealthy and more powerful than most countries on the planet. And that's a real problem because corporations do not have a duty at this point in time to look after people or to meet people's basic human rights or people's basic needs, let alone the fact that they're completely undemocratic in the way that they operate and the way that they work. So we've got to do something about this fundamental problem. Now, this treaty that has been talked about at the UN is not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a long process. It's going to be a 10 or 15 year campaign to get this. But we've never been in a better position to do it because... A few years ago, Ecuador, South Africa and others um, said, actually, we're fed up with this voluntary regulation on, on big companies. It hasn't worked. It hasn't fundamentally changed things, and we need this treaty. So they're arguing that now. Um, as Dottie told some of you, she was there last week. Um, the, U the EU and the UK and the US have consistently tried to block this treaty going forward. Um, developing countries have said, no, 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 we're not having it. We are, we are going for it this time. We are really going to create this treaty. So in the years to come, we will be asking you for some help in order to neutralise um, governments like our own and to let developing countries go ahead and try and create this treaty and make a really fundamental change in the way that the world's economy works. I compare the way that corporations operate today in many ways to the way that they operated in the United States at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. They were called the robber barons. Certain individuals got fantastically, fabulously wealthy by monopolising railroads, steel, coal production um, and banking. Phenomenally wealthy. Well, most people in society had virtually no rights and lived in appalling conditions and worked in appalling conditions. That was brought to an end. And it was brought to an end by people mobilising, by progressive taxation being brought in, by the regulation and breaking up of those corporate monopolies. And by eventually, after the Second World War in this country, creating a welfare state that said things like health, things like education are too important to be controlled by the market. It's not right that your access to those basic things, those basic needs that you have, um, is dependent on how much money you earn. That was changed in the United States in the 1910s and 1920s. It was changed here after the Second World War. We need to change it again on a global scale. And I think for all of the strange, I said earlier, strange political times that we're living in now, for all the frightening things that are happening, 
I have also never known, certainly in my lifetime, a time of greater opportunity, a time when we really can change the fundamental way that the economy works. So um, thanks for being here.